Okay, hi everybody. I'm Odin. I think I recognize most of you, so you probably know who I am. But those who don't, I, I'm, a, I'm a nerd. Um, I work on microcontrollers. And in that domain, people keep telling me to use C because it's faster, it's more performant, it's closer to the metal, and so on. Right? And so kind of out of that frustration um, came this talk. <laughs> Um, I didn't really know what to name it. I've actually submitted it to several conferences so far. And uh, then I just gave it a really clickbaity title. And hi, all of you people. <laughs> I was kind of expecting to give this to a room of like three people that I knew. But uh, apparently, a lot of people are interested. So uh, we could like go through a lot of other like clickbaity titles, right? I say hello to my little friend after optimization, of course. So we're going we're gonna to go through uh, sort of several steps. Um, we're going to first sort of have a bit of a meta discussion about uh, optimization in sort of niche domains, right? I mean, if, if, if you're on a server architecture, it's probably very similar to a lot of other server architectures. On the other hand, if you're a high frequency trader, your server architecture has FPGAs in it, <laughs> right? Um, and so it's you know very different all of a sudden, and and so is my domain, right? Uh, you know we have very niche architecture, very niche hardware, very niche stuff that the optimizer doesn't really know anything about, right? So we're going to look at sort of the concrete problem. We're going to look at my concrete problem, but there's probably a lot of carryover to your concrete problem, right? In the, in the optimization potential, and we're going to look at a concrete solution, which is. Uh, optimizing template using a template metaprogramming engine. And then we're going to look at sort of at the end, well, did it actually work? Was it actually faster? Right? This is actually about a library that is in production that we do use. Um, it was my first large scale template metaprogramming project. And very early in my career, so it's terribly ugly. I don't suggest you use it, but we do. <laughs> But first, sort of, you know, getting getting to the meta discussion, um, you know, there's there's a couple things that we can just kind of assume, right? Uh, uh, you know, hardware differs from the abstract machine, well, obviously, right? The abstract machine is some slightly modified, somewhat simplified Van Neumann architecture from before all of we were born, all of us were born, right? Uh, so the optimizer basically makes up the difference, right? It fills the gap, right? We program conceptually at least against the abstract machine and then the optimizer says, well, no, you're actually on that concrete machine, so I'm gonna do all the optimization and make this perform it again on your machine, right? Except sort of expressing ourselves to Clang intermediate code, right? Uh, from, from my brain to Clang IR, there's a lot of loss there in, in knowledge, you know, domain specific knowledge, I don't even in C++ sometimes have the syntax to express what I know about the problem that could help the optimizer, right? So the optimizer can only optimize as much as it understands, and so if communication to the optimizer is lossy, then it doesn't optimize it, right? And as we saw sort of you know, in the keynote, for example, um, you know, the, the first example Hannah gave was uh, you know, her, her regex where she wasn't actually capturing. She was just you know, testing match, right? And in the first example, the optimizer didn't figure out that uh, whatever that word was, was also a subset of all letters. And so it could just simplify this uh, graph, right? Because why should, it, why should it look at that, right? I mean, why should it try and figure that out? There's just so many potential optimizations if you, if you uh, look at enough patterns and at big enough patterns, but we don't really have the resources for that, especially since, I mean, looking at my domain, there's something like 30,000 flavors of microcontrollers, <laughs> each with their own specific optimization potential in different patterns, right? This is, this is not the solution, right? So, 
So we need to be able to express ourselves to some optimizer in some way that it can reason better about optimization potential, right? About constraints and whatnot. But we probably shouldn't like extend the abstract machine or extend the C++ core language or, I mean, in the other keynote, we already heard as a question sort of uh, problems with bit fields and reflection or bit fields and serialization, right? We added this thing called bit fields in language space to solve a domain specific problem. And I mean, yeah, I, I don't want to debate the merits, but it certainly costs as far as extending the language in other ways, right? So, so it costs to put things in the language, it costs to modify the abstract machine, right? So, you know, can, 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 can we actually get to um, a world where we can express ourselves to an optimizer with less loss in domain specific knowledge, but not uh, extend the language to the point where it's bloated or extend the abstract machine or extend the optimizer backend to a lot of domain specific use cases. And I would argue like if you have in your code some kind of inline assembler or are using the volatile keyword, then you're probably losing a whole lot of uh, um, information when doing that, right? Like, why did you mark that volatile, right? Well, maybe that thing's observable. That change is observable to the outside world. Well, how is it observable? And what is affected, right? I, you know, in my domain, maybe uh, when I write to that register, then some other register's value changes, but only one register, right? So I only have to worry about reordering those two and not the world, right? But that information gets lost, right? And with inline assembler, okay, we have clobber lists, right? We can sort of kind of express this to the optimizer and say, hey, you know, there's this hidden input or there's this hidden output, right? This clobbers that. But that's also still lossy, right? We're going to see examples of this later. That even even you know listing clobbers is is still not enough to give the optimizer enough information to actually optimize the problem properly. Right? As I mentioned earlier, uh, this can be very 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 domain specific, right? I mean. Uh, <laughs> What the observable effects are of changing things could depend on the wiring on the circuit board that the microcontroller is soldered to, right? Like in one case, I don't care that I'm changing that pin state. It's not connected to anything. You can optimize that. In the other case, no, 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 no. That like is fire the missiles. Don't do that, right? Uh, so, you know, we obviously don't want to recompile Clang for every circuit board, right? Yeah, we, 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 we'd also bloat it, right? So there's another space where we can actually do optimization. And I was kind of expecting this to be contentious, but then in Hannah's keynote, she's like, oh yeah, obviously in library space, I like prune this big graph of transitions and do all this stuff because the optimizer won't do it for me, right? So yeah, she thought that battle. And so yeah, I, this, I, I, uh, I use, library space to uh, um, fix the problem of loss of expressiveness when I'm using inline assembler or volatile, right? You know, you, you probably should, you know, my, my, my sort of maybe contentious uh, claim is you probably should be doing this too, right? If you are using inline assembler or you are using volatile to express interaction with the hardware, then you should probably be reducing that to basic blocks of assembler or basic blocks using volatile and then uh, composing those basic blocks in some domain specific language. Obviously, giant asterisk. It's the biggest asterisk that PowerPoint would let me put on a slide. Um, I obviously don't know anything about your domain, but uh, as far as my knowledge goes, and I will try and convince you of that throughout this, this talk. So we're going on to the sort of the concrete problem. This is a microcontroller on a golf ball. 
And uh, there are a lot of golf balls with microcontrollers in them, actually. Um, I mean, the golf ball probably costs a lot more than the microcontroller. And uh, there's you know something like 100 microcontrollers per person on Earth, right, at this point. I mean, you as first world nerds probably own closer to 1,000 of them. <laughs> right? There are several hundred in your car. And here's sort of a block diagram of what I was on my uh, desk at work right now. Um, this is, you know, something equivalent to a mid-90s computer, runs at 200-something megahertz and whatnot, right? But there are big differences, both in the way we program these things and in the actual hardware, because, you know, if you had, for the sake of argument, 100 mid-90s computers in your room, your electricity bill would not thank you. I mean, you would save on heating, but um, yeah, so they have to be very, very power efficient. Um, and cheap. And we also, with a mid 90s computer, we have some administrative action, right? Like if something crashes, we can restart it again, right? Or we can restart it again once and then look, hey, did that solve the problem? No, the problem's probably somewhere else, right? We can interact with these things. Whereas most things that have a microcontroller in them, we have exactly one administrative action. And that is unplugging it and plugging it back in again, right? And uh, apparently this happens so often that even though I did not show this to my son, he, uh, he was playing with his pretend vacuum cleaner, right? And then, okay, noise stopped. He looks at it, goes to the couch, unplugs it, plugs it back in, you know, between the couch cushions, right? So, so this apparently happens a lot at my house, right? It's kind of a... Uh, and sort of knee-jerk reaction. But then there's also systems where you, you can't, you don't even have that administrative action, right? Like if it's built into your wall or if it's in a box in Siberia or something, then if that thing doesn't come back up into a valid state, you're flying to Siberia. <laughs> Maybe in the middle of the winter, <laughs> right? Um, so we have to program these considerably different, right? We actually have to handle all errors. And at, at least to the point where we are guaranteed to come back to some defined state at some point, right? And you know, in, in most jobs, like, okay, I crashed, but I didn't leak resources, so I'm better than most of you, right? That's, that's good enough, right? But so, so the designs are comparatively incredibly simple, right? You know, a lot of the times it's easier to prove that an error cannot happen than handle it properly, <laughs> right? And so that just kind of pushes these things into the hard real-time domain almost always, right? Well, I can't handle a timeout. I don't have enough like flash to write that much program. So I'm just gonna like make sure that never times out, right? And another thing this has to do with power saving in hard real-time is I have on here different I guess I don't have a pointer that'll show up on video. Different DMAs, right? Giant bus matrix. Uh, here's where all the peripherals are, like the serial port or the, or the uh, you know, network dryer, uh, uh, hardware and whatnot. And I have a bunch of different RAMs, right? I got RAM up there and then below another RAM and another one down here, another RAM down there. And they're all wired on sort of different bus matrices. And so they're gonna have different bus latencies or be clocked differently. Or when I sleep, I maybe turn three of them off and just leave one of them on, right? So I'm already kind of fighting with C++ here because it doesn't really have the concept of memory regions, right? All RAM is equal. And then I have down here, all these guys on the AHB peripherals bus, which have address space that's not actually RAM. <laughs> Right? I have a bunch of configuration registers there. Right? And I have transfers going on across these buses, which are, hey, I found the unicorn pen. Or you know, maybe a DMA transfer triggered by something will just knock out that bus for a certain amount of bus cycles because it's transferring some block of data to somewhere. Right? So I better model my program that I'm not relying on that bus to do something else because otherwise I have latency problems, 
right? And so, you know, modern optimizers on like normal hardware will say, okay, I'm going to load memory early because it might take a while for it to get there, right? So they'll reorder things or, or it will schedule your, your uh, multiplications because, uh, you know, it takes a couple or, or divisions or whatever because it takes a while to do one, right? So we'll reorder all the stuff you do to put, you know, some division first and then X number of cycles later, the next division, X number of cycles later, and then everything else kind of happens in between where you're waiting for the, for the floating point unit, right? Can we do that here? Well, not really, because the whole timing clock tree stuff is completely configurable. <laughs> right? so, so modern compilers just treat all bus cycles equal or don't reorder things to optimize bus cycles, which is a shame because they may take a long time, right? If you're in a configuration where you're Processor is running at a high clock speed, but mostly sleeping, right? But you need to leave some bus matrix on because you're waking up when somebody sends you a byte on a serial port or something. You're going to clock that way down, right? So, so maybe when you when your CPU wants to read two things from that bus, then you're going to be waiting I don't know 64 instruction cycles or something for each of those. And it would be good if the optimizer knew this, but it doesn't stand a chance, obviously. This is configurable at runtime. So, so we're sort of discovering a bunch of optimization potential that is missing here. And for this, I can't really help you yet. Um, I mean, if, if we knew that this was configured with const expert stuff and we knew something about the hardware, then maybe we could get there. But there's actually lower hanging fruit, right? So this is one of the serial ports. This is from the data sheet. This is one of the serial port sort of block diagrams. And it's called a USART because writing serial port didn't sound nerdy enough, I guess. I mean, it's a subclass of serial ports, right? So we have here a bunch of different control registers that influence how this thing works, right? So I'm just going to pick two of them, right? We have a, a, a control register one and the interrupt control register. We look at this in the data sheet. Here's sort of the beginning of the description of control register one. And like I literally picked the controller I was working on, picked serial port because it's the most relatable thing probably, and picked the control register because it's again the most relatable thing. And then here the very first bit field description is already weird, <laughs> right? I mean, I guess hardware devs have a very black sense of humor. Or I don't know what the deal is here, right? But this is a logical thing, you know, a logical uh, uh, um, configuration, you know, field that is made up of two bits that are not next to each other, right? They're bit 28 and bit 12. <laughs> and zero in both bits, okay, that's eight bits on your serial port. 0, 1, okay, that's 9 bits. And 1, 0 is 7 bits, because that's obviously logical. So, okay, how would you interact with this thing? Does this break bit fields? Kind of. I mean, I can't really say there's a bit field where one field is two bits that are not next to each other. That's not part of C++'s language, right? So. Yeah, this wasn't cherry picked. This just happened to come up. And there's a lot of examples of stuff that doesn't work with bit fields. And, and in, in the SG14, we actually kind of rehashed this a bunch of times. Like, can we extend bit fields to the point where they're useful for this? No. <laughs> and we'll get to a little more in a minute, right? This, no. <laughs> I mean, I think at these companies, the hardware team and the uh, software team, oops, my batteries. There we go. Um, the hardware team and the software team are probably like on different continents and don't have phones or something, right? I, sure, if, if we had like, well, we're programming in handwritten assembler, this would be fine, right? So okay, so bit fields don't work, so how are we gonna actually interact with this register? 
And there's another thing you see, and you know, the, the actually the first three bits in this thing are reserved, right? Well, what does reserved means? Well, it probably means that on this chip, it's not wired to anything, right? So it doesn't matter what you write there, except you probably should be writing zeros there, which happen to be the reset value here. There are also reserved bits where you need to write ones, um, because the next version of the chip might have something wired there. And this is actually not a super uncommon problem, right? Like, I had a design, I mean, that was back in the bad old days when I programmed assembler. Um, I corrupted reserve bits somewhere. At least I suspect that's why the new version of the chip didn't work with the same firmware. Um, and so basically, I kept buying the old version of the same chip, uh, of, of the chip because I figured that'd probably be easier than finding the right. And, and so, you know, luckily, there's a speculation market on chips for, you know, people will speculate, yeah, there's probably a few people that are stupid as Odin. And so we're just going to buy a bunch and then sell them off. And so you have to pay for interest and opportunity costs, or uh, interest and, and uh, um, yeah, for, for their opportunity costs. And so I probably spent about, 30 grand that I wouldn't have otherwise needed to spend because the product lived a lot longer than I expected because I corrupted one of these bits. <laughs> you can write a lot of templates for 30 grand. <laughs> right? So that was one of the motivations which uh, you know, led me to write the solution that we'll see in the next section. But again, like, how, how would you interact with this register in C++? Right? And you know, okay. This is kind of the norm. You have ugly macro one with two ugly macros as parameters. And then once you, you know, resolve this entire forest of ugly macros, it ends up being casting this fixed number to unsight. I mean, this is probably undefined behavior, but it happens to work. Um, like, I don't know how else, I guess, what, like bless or something we're getting to where you can actually, without undefined behavior, make some object somewhere without initializing it. You really don't want to initialize something there because then you'd be writing, right? Hand in the back. Well, in the, in the case of APM, uh, you can just use APM HAL library. Yes. But it's not optimal for the huge flow. Yes. Um, we will actually get to that. Yes. Um, uh, this is actually, uh, well, actually, a couple slides later, we actually have some code from the STHAL. Uh, um, so this is super ugly and super error prone, right? I mean, as you can see, our bad rate is, our, our number of bits is obviously nine, right? That's what we're <laughs> configuring here. Um, and if we also wanted to change some other bit field in this same register, well, we could just OR the masks together, and we could OR the data together, and then we could, you know, change, mul you know, I, we, could, we could do multiple interactions on this register at the same time, which is an optimization, right? And that's actually why a lot of code looks like this, right? Sadly. So let's look at the next register, right? Okay, we got a few more reserved bits this time, right? Um, We also have this sort of weird description, right? Writing to one to this bit clears the WUF, whatever the hell that means, flag in this other register, <laughs> right? So, so how would I express this as assembler clobbers? They'd have to be like conditional clobbers, right? Because only when I actually write one is it affecting this other register, right? If we went down the description, it's affecting all these other registers, all these other bits, right? The other thing, okay, so I, so I have a register where if I write one, it will clear it. So that's logical, right? Um, so, so in the other, you know, the previous register example, we, um, we kind of read, masked off what we wanted to change, and then ordered in our changes, and then wrote it back, right? What if one of those bits that we, one of those fields that we didn't want to touch had one of these, you know, set to clear registers? Well, we would have inadvertently cleared it, right? Yeah, 
OK, so you have to like read the entire data sheet and memorize it, or else you can't really do code review. But the data sheet's like 2,000 pages long, and that's just for the chip, and then you need the other 4,000 pages of like core specific stuff from ARM and whatever, and so like I'm not capable of that. Uh, so, <laughs> so life is kind of pain, right? Uh, the other, but, but the other observation you can make here is, I have a default, right? If I write zero, it doesn't do anything, right? So we have, we have an optimization potential here. We don't need to read, modify, write. We could just write, because we know things about the bits in this register, right? All the, zero, all the reserves, oh, those have to be zeros, right? Yes. Um, that is actually a very interesting distinction. You work on microcontrollers. Kept at reset value and write the reset value are two different meanings. And sometimes they write one, and sometimes they write the other, and sometimes they mean one, and sometimes they mean the other, and they don't quite map to each other. Um, there are I have seen registers where you do actually have to write zero back. So, so, so we have sort of an uh, ambiguous description here. If you actually look at the manufacturer's code, they're just writing zeros in some cases, and they're writing back what came in in some cases. Right? That makes a note really hard because you have to know yeah. whether it's supported or not. There's also a machine readable data sheet, which is dictated by ARM for all color of Cortex microcontrollers. And in the machine readable data sheet, they don't often agree with the human readable data sheet. <laughs> um, and they also don't often agree with the chip. And they don't really seem to care. A, you know, a friend of mine um, is crazy. And so he, uh, he scraped all of the PDFs of all of the uh, um, SD microelectronics microcontrollers and read all the machine real data sheets and compared them. And he also scraped their code generating tool and compared that. And you know, tool submitted, I think, 30,000 bug reports. <laughs> and they didn't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we've got another problem here, right? For, for an optimizer to actually be able to optimize this, we need a, a, a correct model of the hardware, which we don't have, right? So this is pulled out of the SD HAL somewhere, right? So, uh, I mean, they have kind of two HALs, which are kind of mixed, where one, they actually have functions, right? So you call a function and say, OK, set this bit field to this. And there, you obviously can't merge because it's two different function calls and the operation is marked volatile, and so the optimizer can't merge those bit field interactions. And here, I mean, I guess the dev just didn't realize that he could merge because, like, this and this are both in the same register, and this and this are both in the same register, and this and this are both in the same register, and they're, you know, they're not relying on each other, right? You know, you, you can, can reconfigure two pins at the same time. That's fine, right? I mean, you probably should enable the clock first. So there's probably a sequence point after that, right? And then, uh, you know, but setting like the GPL alternate function and configuring it to high speed and blah, blah, blah. So this is from the initialization sequence of the um, C report. And you can see at the end of the initialization sequence, they're turning on interrupts, right? That means interrupts could fire, right? So what if I'm configuring the second serial port? The first one already turned on its interrupts. Its interrupt fires. It's configuring a DMA, which for some reason conflicts with one of these registers, right? There's, I mean, it's probably not going to happen, but this is all over the STHAL, right? Uh, and all over every microcontroller framework. We're sharing these registers, right? These are, you know, these configuration registers 
are just an address on a bus. They're essentially global variables. Right? And so it doesn't happen very often, but you can have race conditions on these things. I, I actually had one on this microcontroller a couple weeks ago, it was a problem in the ST hell where uh, they have this macro called lock, and this macro called lock doesn't actually lock. What it does is it makes an, does an early return with some status code. Because we have weird threads, right? These are, these are interrupt service routines that are interrupting you and running on your stack. So you can't just wait till the other guy's done. You have to do something else, who knows, right? So they're kind of deferring the problem. The problem is though, I'm in this interrupt service routine, I couldn't configure this thing. It returned me some error that it's already being used. What do I do? I have to return, otherwise, it, so I'd like, what, set a timer and then try again? And what state am I in for that amount of time or whatever? I mean, this is just a terrible, I mean, I, internally we call these throw locks. Because <laughs> essentially an earlier return of status code is essentially the same as throwing exception. They try and bubble it up the chain, except they're daisy chaining this so they forget. Right? So in their own code, configuring a, a uh, you know, a DMA, um, if one DMA configuration interrupts the other, then it doesn't like re-aim the DMA at the other RAM because it was busy, right? But they just continue on with the rest of the configuration, right? So as soon as that DMA fires, you're just corrupting some RAM somewhere, right? And uh, I complained about this to my ST representative and he ignored us. And I cleaned it again and he ignored us and I read, I, I, okay, I have this, this really awesome cron job where I just tell one of my colleagues to like call the guy every two weeks. And, and then we complained to his boss and I think he got fired and so we have a new SD representative. And he still hasn't talked to us about this. So they don't really seem to care, right? But like how can we solve this in a way where we don't have all these bugs, right? And we have this optimized. Right? Well, why don't we express ourselves in a domain specific language? Right? So, so what I do here is I take and I, I, I rip the machine readable data sheet and in some cases the human readable data sheet and then look at all the conflicts and try and fix them by hand with this extension format <laughs> and whatnot, right? And I generate const expert instances of these things. I'm sorry this is hard on the eyes. This is old code of mine when I didn't know like how to format code properly with underscores and everything. Anyway, um, so here I have this type called address and this type called field location. And they take a bunch of template parameters and have, you know, nothing in them, right? And I make cance expert variables of these empty structs with a bunch of template information in them. And that's what these, you know, GPIO clock enable. This is a global cance expert variable that's empty, but my set function can then read this and say, okay, well, this is the location and I want to set something. And, you know, there's actually registers where I actually write a zero to set it, right? So that's encoded in the address information and that's in there. And so if I'd said clear on that one thing, then it would have written a wrong one because that's obviously the logical thing to do. Right? <clears throat> and the advantage of having this in a domain specific language is I can just say atomic. I don't have to understand how to do that, right? I mean, if I have defaults and I'm writing all the bit fields that don't have defaults, well then just writing is already atomic, right? At least in intents and purposes of this system, right? With one core, but interrupts as the race conditioning thing. I can also say sequence point explicitly. And if I don't say sequence point, that means, hey, you get to reorder all this, right? I also have this, you know, I, for example, I have this factory function write, right? Well, if there's weird stuff going on in this register, I want to know about it in code review. So if there's some like clear on read or, or set to clear or whatever, something going on, yes, a question. Uh, why do you need a sequence point here? You're writing registers uh, in the first line and uh, then in the second atomic block and write into a register according to the data sheet of ST is uh, modifying the 
region of memory which synchronizes every operation, so you don't need sequence points between writing to such registers? Uh, yes, good question. Um, the question was why I need a sequence point here because uh, loads and stores are inherently atomic on this architecture, right? Um, well, because setting one bit in one bit field is not just a store, right? I load the register, I mask off all the bits that are not the bit field I'm changing. Then I, uh, or in the, the bits that I am changing, and then I store it, right? So if, for example, I've loaded the register, I've masked it off, then I get interrupted by somebody who loads that same register, mutates it in some way on some other bit field, not the one I'm interested in, returns, I have a local copy of this register that doesn't have their change, and I flush it back to memory. Right? That's the inherent race condition on this. Because you know, GPIO clock enable, that's in some clock register with all these other bus clocks in it that people may be changing. Uh, well, you wouldn't want to uh, enable the clock after you change the speed. Ah, okay, now I get your question. Yeah. Uh, um, because from here to here is my own domain-specific language and I do reorder things. Okay. So this is my sequence point telling my TMP to not reorder stuff across that boundary. So on the other end of this TMP, right, I, I have these sort of basic blocks, right? And this happens to be a basic block where all the parameters are compile time known, right? I can say, here's the address, here's the value, and it'll just put those right in inline assembler. Right? And there's a lot of debuggers that just go crazy when they see this and like start to step through files that are not the file you're actually stepping through or start showing you absolutely everything in assembler, including the stuff that was your C++ and whatever. But as far as uh, code gen, this, this works. You generate valid code, right? And so obviously I have a bunch of others, you know, basic blocks. Maybe I have some runtime known value that's coming in here and then F would have a parameter and whatnot. So I take uh, you know, this, uh, from, from this uh, um, DSL, I take all of these sort of uh, lazy created uh, um, uh, things and uh, run them through a giant template monster. Right? Which basically, I mean, I'm not going to show code because it's ugly and terrible and whatnot, but basically what this thing does right now is takes the string, splits it up by sequence point. Each one of those packages, it'll sort it at compile time on address, right? And then it will you know, do a reduce, merging all the ones that are to the same address, right? Then it'll map this thing to uh, basic blocks, where the translation from basic, you know, from from operation to basic block, is not always entirely intuitive, because if I want uh, if I want an atomic operation on a register, and I'm touching, you know, all the bit fields in the first byte, but not all the other ones, right? Then I could, in sort of a compare and swap. We actually have what I call supercas because it's a compare and swap that tells you if you were interrupted at all, right? It will fail if you're interrupted at all rather than if somebody actually modified this. So you don't have the ABA problem. Um, so I could, yeah, I could put this in my compare and swap block and make it atomic that way. Or if I'm allowed to on this microcontroller, like if the bus is wired such that I can also do 8-bit stores, I could just write that lowest byte and not the other ones, right? I also have a, um, you know, some hardware in the uh, uh, microcontroller to be able to actually address bits. 
So if you were in this certain address range, the so-called bit banding address range, well then you take the bit that you want to, or the address that you want to write, and uh, subtract some constant, and then uh, multiply it by eight, and then uh, add the bit offset, and then write a bool to that address, it will write to that single bit. It's called bit banding, right? And this results in terribly unreadable, horrible code, because nobody understands what you're doing. And the time I wrote the library, I was like, okay, well, let's see how other people are using bit banding. So I went on GitHub, and uh, there were like 80 people that had included the header, and of that, like two actually used anything from that header. And one of them was wrong. <laughs> so yeah, that's obviously not viable in normal user code. But uh, it's just a policy in my code generator, right? So we can make this ugly under the hood. Yes? Uh, as far as I remember, bit banding is just a read, multiply, write operation and ignore the it. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's not atomic uh, with regard to DMAs. A DMA does not support bit banding. No, 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 but, but, but if a DMA hits the register during the read, modify, write, then uh, um, it will corrupt it, right? But if uh, an interrupt service routine fires in the middle, then uh, I guess technically it's not guarded. But to actually get into your interrupt service routine takes many more cycles than it takes for that operation to complete. So it is not necessarily possible for an ISR to actually interrupt that. Right? Yes, yes. Um, I've actually had conversations with ARM engineers about this, and they tell me that this is OK. <laughs> um, I, I guess I, I've actually looked at, at uh, like bus clock timings and whatever and actually found uh, bugs in ARM CMSYS regarding like interrupt turning off you and whatever. I'm pretty confident about that, but yeah, I mean, this is sign of a gray, gray area. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, okay, the, uh, we'll put it another way. If this is a race condition in some very, very niche case, um, it's not top of the priority stack. Like, there's a bazillion, like, very, very obvious race conditions in essentially every library that uh, we could solve first. <laughs> so, what about reading in this DSL, right? We have this kind of inherent problem of, well, if this register is marked volatile, it's maybe changing in the meantime, right? Uh, so, or, or you know, reading it may modify it. I mean, very, very typical bug. Uh, a lot of time, interrupt status flags are going to be clear on read, right? So when you read it, all, they clear all the flags, right? Because you read them, right? So if you say, if this thing mask this is true, then, OK, this flag is set, and we'll go down that. And then, OK, if this other flag is set, well, I'll wait. The first if already cleared that, right, because it read the register. And so this actually happened a lot on my team. And so I basically said, OK, how do you stop people from doing things? We make it more typing to do that. Make another way that's safe that's less typing, and then they'll just automatically switch over. Right? So when you read things in an apply statement, it returns you essentially a, a tuple of bit fields, right? This tuple of bit fields may be the contents of one register or multiple registers, depending on what you read, right? So this probably, is, I mean, this is a library-only solution for bit fields, essentially. And yeah, for all intents and purposes in my domain, in my use case, this is better than bit fields because it understands weird bit fields, right? Like it understands the bit fields that are disjunct, right? Or it understands that you know it, it is it is type safe in a certain sense, right? Um, you know, back a couple of slides ago, um, we see that we have the ability to uh, specify the type that corresponds to this field location. This could be an enum, right? I mean, in the case of our you know how many data, data bits does the serial port support? Well, this should be an enum, right? Because nobody should like have to read the data sheet to say, oh, yes, 
one in bit 24 and zero in bit, what was that, 12? I don't remember. Uh, well, that means seven bit uh, mode for the serial port, right? No, it should just be an enum seven bit mode, right? And we'd also generate these enums out of the machine readable data sheet, right? So they're probably less error prone than um, the than doing it by hand, right? And they're certainly a lot faster, right? So I so I uh, uh, can can kind of express the the you know this kind of thing in in the form of of a um, of a bit field tuple. So since this is a you know a a a list of operations that are all empty as far as data goes, they're just compile time information. I can actually configure the initialization sequences of all of my peripherals in the form of a list of operations and sequence points. Right? This is not necessarily code, this is kind of DSL code, right? But but I can save this, you know, the convention is just an it. So 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 every driver has a local const x per variable called an it. And in this variable, you have all the operations that you need to initialize this thing. Right? So all of, the, all of the drivers then go into the one macro in the entire system called run, <laughs> which is all of your startup code and the initialization of all of the drivers, right? The initialization of the entire hardware. So this is potentially a lot of operations. Right? And this is why I stopped this project and decided to optimize TMP instead. <laughs> because I couldn't do as much optimization as I wanted to do because TMP was not like powerful enough at that point in time, right? So because you know you 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 potentially could do a lot of optimizations. First of all, it's in my framework. I know interrupts are off, right? You, you have like a separate variable that says what interrupts you want turned on, right? And I do that last, right? You cannot turn on interrupts during initialization. So everything that's atomic, I can just optimize it with a different policy, if you will, right? And I also know I'm the first thing running, right? So the first write does not need to read modify write because the reset values are known, right? And you could even run it in a mode that actually verifies that the reset values are the reset values that are coming from the machine real data sheet because they actually diverge. But you know, if you've run that once and you're convinced that the reset values are correct, then you just need to write bam, 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 right? And uh, um, it is actually particularly useful in cases where you care about energy consumption at startup. Right? I mean, most of the time you don't care. Right, like flash is cheap. This uses more flash. Okay, cry me a river. Right, uh, startup people usually don't care about how fast startup goes. I'm not going to be, you know, communicating with anyone. Right. I mean, okay, if I crash, that has to do with how fast I come back up. But if you are some, you know, energy harvesting thing where you have like some tiny solar panel, or maybe you're basically har harvesting energy off of, you know, RF something or whatever. Footsteps, yeah, that's another good one. Um, yeah, we were we were considering um, uh, you know making a system that just you know parasitically consumes power from uh, power lines that are high voltage and near, right? So we you know we just have an antenna and uh, just consume that power into a little cheap like super cap that has you know a couple farad capacity. And we never really do much, right? We wake up, we send one tiny, tiny uh, message uh, over Sigfox, and then we fall asleep again, right? And that takes some unit of energy, which is much, much, much smaller than startup, <laughs> right? So we have to dimension our super cap large enough that it is large, you know, that it that it can store enough energy that it won't empty during startup, right? Because we will have to reset at some point, probably, right? Um, so if I can optimize startup to just be a block copy of stuff into registers, and I can merge all of those registers, uh, you know, we actually didn't end up doing that project, but uh, we did uh, solve the problem in that 
we optimize startup by about 60x, right? <laughs> With this DSL. And there's still a lot more that we could potentially do, right? I mean, I've, I've optimized TMP to the point where I have a lot of power and I haven't actually come back to this project, right? But uh, <clears throat> I could actually start expressing uh, things like this, you know, a, 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 a template that I can specialize to say, hey, this register here, I'm only touching that in this interrupt context. So you don't have to make it atomic, right? All the drivers don't know, right? They're generic drivers written by someone else, right? But if I can specialize the traits and say, okay, I'm promising to only touch this in, you know, main thread or something, then I can configure it to check, right? Or I can, uh, uh, I can optimize that with a different policy, essentially, uh, based on trait specialization. <laughs> and there's actually a whole bunch of other stuff that just kind of came out in the wash. I, I have a traits class, sort of very down at the very bottom, where we're generating these basic blocks, which you can specialize, right? So you can say, I want to listen to everything that is written to this register. I have a bunch of extra debugging potential, right? Or I want to check every time someone touches this register what the interrupt priority is. <laughs> or uh, I want to check the worst amount of time between touching this register and then that register, greatest time delta, right? Uh, or I can develop the whole thing on my desktop, right? And uh, just mock out the hardware. <laughs> by specializing this template, right? I have a giant vector that's all this, all these special function registers values, and I have another vector of uh, a standard function that just updates whatever it wants to whenever you touch a register, and then I also just log everything to console, <laughs> right? So when, I, when I'm writing a driver, I write it against console and not against hardware, because then I don't have to like reflash the chip, and I have way better debugging, and blah, 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 blah and then I can eventually uh, flash a chip. I can also mock out the hardware with the hardware, right? This is uh, uh, actually Paul Tarosh, one of my uh, colleagues. Uh, this is his invention. But uh, he basically said, OK, um, I'm going to write, uh, you know, mock out all of the register interactions and write a piece of software that tells the debugger to write that to that register or to read that register, right? So I don't flash anything to the chip. I just connect it to the debugger and then run this thing. <laughs> and it's slow, but it could be highly optimized. I don't think people use debuggers for that yet. Um, I, you know, we did a little proof of concept. I think we could make the debugger about a thousand times faster in that. Because I mean, the, the bandwidth to uh, internals is actually quite high, right? I mean, you can. Uh, almost read and write registers in something like 20 megahertz, or, right? And that's probably as fast as you're doing it anyway, right? But what about sort of the the general use case of is it is it faster than C? Well, uh, there have been there is my sort of personal experience, and then there was a a study by the um, uh, University of Dortmund and the University of Utrecht, and they compared different things. Dortmund, they compared their sort of uh, C implementation of some robot controller with the rewrite, and they rewrote uh, pretty much exactly 30% of the code, and the thing got 30% faster. Right? <laughs> um, then the you know the 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 uh, uh, Chris Miele and Jan Holsma from from Utrecht did a much more sort of uh, involved comparison between uh, ARM's embed and the STHAL and uh, Quasir Quasir register. Don't name a library register. Really don't name a library a namespace register. Like at the time it crashed all the compilers when I said okay now I want lowercase. Yeah. 
terrible idea. As I said, send the view, right? But uh, yeah, I mean, compared to, uh, you know, they, they did one of their benchmarks, which I thought was the funniest, was I just want to blink an LED, right? How, how much code do I need to blink an LED on, you know, this microcontroller, right? And, and you know, I think, uh, you know, their handwritten assembler was something like 10 words less than my library. And because of one bug, which I fixed, and then it was the same. Right? And, and then uh, um, STHAL was something like 15x more flash and 5x slower on blinking the LED. And ARM embed, uh, I mean, this is the library that is you know, from ARM for its Cartex microcontrollers, and it's trying to be safe. Right? And it's trying to be safe not doing anything at compile time, which is not the right way to do it. <laughs> Um, because we couldn't really do a flash comparison because for this particular chip, blinking an LED actually overflowed the flash using our embed, right? So they had to actually optimize our embed to actually get it on the chip, but it was something like 500x uh, larger. And toggling the pin was 300x slower because they were actually taking some lock, <laughs> right? <laughs> Unfair, yes. Yes. Okay. The comment is that it's uh, an unfair comparison because ARM doesn't actually produce the hardware, and a lot of this is in uh, peripherals that were designed by the actual uh, uh, hardware vendor, like by STM in this case, and not by ARM itself. Um, so uh, you know the fact that uh, actually in embed a lot of the drivers are also written by the hardware vendor and not by ARM itself, but the architecture is from ARM, right? And toggling a pin should not take a lock. That is ARM's decision, right? I mean, OK, maybe it should take a lock in some situations, yes. But that should be opt-outable, <laughs> right? That should be configurable. STM's problem. STM's problem, yes. Um, yes, Jeff. Writing IO controller is a CPU bound. Yeah, I'm, I'm astonished that, that there's any measurable right. It's not IO register. <laughs> like, but, but all of this, all of this, you know, compiler code trickery is, is results in a meaningful difference. It's amazing. Well, um, yes, it is. Like, for, for, uh, you know, the comment was that it's that it's amazing that it's CPU bound to begin with, and. Um, the uh, the thing is, uh, because these registers are obser externally observable, we are essentially disabling all optimization on them, right? And so, abstraction is no longer zero cost unless you deal in the semantics of uh, um, optimization potential on these things, right? Because we understand as users or as you know somebody that scraped the machine readable data sheet. Uh, how these things are observable. So then we can put up the optimization back in, right? I mean, if we look at, uh, for example, the bus clock register, right? There are probably uh, 20 other peripherals touching that bus clock register because there's 32 bits in it <laughs> and you're enabling a lot of the things, right? So because they don't know anything about each other, because we have encapsulation, Right? We're doing this right. We have you know, a UART init function and a uh, ADC init function and a DMA init function and a whatnot. Right? Um, we are reading that bus clock register, changing one bit, writing it back. Right? Again and again and again and again. Whereas we could just read that thing, change all the bits and write it back. Or if it's a startup and I know I'm the first one to touch it, we could just write it. Right? And then on top of that, we could write it right after we wrote the power clock register that's right next to it, right? So, I mean, if, if, if you are in a system with a 16-bit instruction set and 32-bit addressing, it takes a couple of instructions to load an address. But you also have a load with offset, right? And a load with offset uh, is just one instruction rather than three, right? So if you do them in order, 
if you can reorder in order to do them in order, <laughs> uh, then you save a lot of address loading, right? So we do it once rather than 20 times. We just write, and we do uh, a, a store with offset. We're something like 60x less assembler than we otherwise would have, right? And so, yeah, it's CPU bound, right? Like it's it's uh, uh, because we're just. I mean, well, it's it's not actually CPU. It's bus clock bound, right? The bus clock operations are in this case the 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 bottleneck, right? So if we're saving those things, then this has obviously a whole lot of. Yes, exactly, exactly, yes, yes. Um, there's actually another bug that's all over the STL by exa uh, for exa uh, by the way. Um, hardware devs are very happy to put um, status flags and uh, you know mailboxes and whatever in one register, even if you're typically going to access those things from two different interrupt contexts, right? So if I want to send a can transfer, right? Then I will set this bit that says write a one to this thing and say, okay, send it off, right? And then if I have received a can transfer, then I can say, okay, I've received that, right? Um, you know, status flag goes up when uh, uh, um, it's been received, and I write a one back when I when it's uh, um, uh, when I've sort of handled it, right? You're probably receiving in an interrupt, and you're probably sending from main thread, right? And the hardware devs are like, okay, our hands are clean. These are in two different bytes. You're allowed to access thing in byte mode. We're good, right? But then almost all HALs uh, abstract a register as a 232-bit thing, right? And so, you know, the driver will be receiving in, in, in interrupt and sending in main. And if those two ever meet, then you will have one phantom message extra, <laughs> right? Um, yeah, so this is, I mean, you know, for, for my team, this has brought down bugs by two orders of magnitude or something. And I, I thought originally that it was about safety, uh, sorry, about uh, speed. And in retrospect, it's more about safety than it was about speed, right? Because once I start putting domain specific information in the compiler, then it can check it. <laughs> what a concept, right? Yeah, so that was uh, my talk. We'll go on to questions. Uh, yes. Uh, how do you configure the clock tree? Uh, there was a screenshot from Cubamix, I guess. Uh, do you still use Cubamix to generate all the code, uh, uh, which is usually very huge? Uh, yes. Uh, the question was how do I how I uh, do clock trees and um, the screenshot was from QMX, and QMX is giant. Like, uh, it's like 1.8 gigabytes, and then you have to then load like your chip family, which is another like gigabyte. So we're at like 2.8 gigabytes in order to program a microcontroller that has 32K of flash, right? <laughs> it's some like giant eclipse monster thing and whatever, right? So uh, for rapid prototyping, we do use QMX uh, a lot of the time to show the customer, hey, we can do this. Like, you know, we'll show up to like the first meeting and say, hey, here's what you wanted. Is this actually what you wanted? We haven't signed a contract yet, but we built this. Is this what you wanted? And they'll say, yes, and so we can ship in a week. And no, we have to rewrite absolutely everything in that thing because that thing will kill people, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, <clears throat> so uh, the, the clock tree stuff in QMX is actually quite good. The problem is you can't just get that, right? Either you generate everything or you, uh, um, uh, yeah, like they, they give you sections where you can put user code in, but they don't give you any of these sections in their drivers so that you can actually fix their drivers, right? So, uh, you know, current project, I think the QMX gave us uh, something like 30% of potential bandwidth on USB, and then we rewrote the driver and got 95% of potential bandwidth on USB high speed, right? So, so we, we rapid prototype in QMX, and then we do this by hand, sadly, <laughs> uh, um, in the actual production code that goes to the customer. There's another project, uh, Modem.io, where they actually do clock tree resolution in Consecper. 
They actually have uh, um, uh, you know data sets from you know some combination of uh, human machine readable data sheet and stuff they've scraped from different vendor tools, <laughs> um, which uh, uh, will allow you to say, okay, I want you know these settings for these bus clocks, and then it'll figure out which values to write where, what the prescaler should be, what the multiplier should be, blah blah blah. And uh, if that's stupid, <laughs> right? Like if you are uh, overclocking something or whatever. Right? So yeah, their their solution is pretty good. Um, I think at some point I'd like to harmonize it into our solution. So that right, but but uh, um, yeah, clock trees aren't really solved yet. So uh, I think back, uh, uh, Jan was. I have the. the Okay, you have the thing, and then we'll go to Jan next. Uh, okay, go for it. For me, the question is always about teachability. Yes. I can somehow grasp what this is about, but I cannot imagine the machinery that's underneath. And the question is, are you able to, let's say, publicly share tiny examples with the required machinery so that I can take that, understand it, maybe extend it, give it to us, our WE professors and tell them, this is how you should teach uh, embedded programming? Uh, that is a goal that I'm working towards. We'll put it that way. Um, as far as right now, uh, this was my first real C++ project, if you will. Um, so it is ugly at times. It was also my first Python project, right? The, 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 the uh, um, you know, data, the, the const expert stuff generator is written in Python. And it is, I mean, it's not, it, it probably doesn't even qualify as Python, right? So I'm quite embarrassed about this, which is why I'm not pushing other people to use it, because they're just going to like, oh, and you were an absolute idiot here and there, and whatever, right? I mean, the, the TMP is some Frankenstein's monster between Stuff that I wrote myself, and then stuff that I, uh, that, and 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 then stuff I ported to BridgeAnd, and then stuff that I, that is in some branch of BridgeAnd, and, and yeah, just ugly. Uh, so, I I started with this, right? Because I thought this was the problem, and this was a problem, but it wasn't the whole problem, right? And then I went to work on interrupt service routines and and sort of uh, uh, sort of provable scheduling kind of things. Um, and then uh, uh, um, uh, Emil Fresk just came along and said, hey, I know how to do this way the hell better than you. And so his CREC library is the way to do this on microcontrollers or deterministic, whatever. Um, so we use that. And then, uh, then it was, OK, drivers, right? Drivers are terrible because drivers need to know things about what you want to use them for, right? And so I developed mixins in order to write drivers properly, right? And then, uh, OK, but event dispatch is absolutely terrible. So that was yesterday's talk, right? So I'm hoping that, because it, it has to be a framework where everything depends on everything, right? You, you can't just solve one part in isolation, which is probably why it hasn't been solved yet, right? If you solve one part in isolation, then you like it's not worth configuring your compiler to run C++ just to have that, right? But so at some you point. Register stuff, that's something. I've seen several solutions, and, and this looks so far, let's say, the nicest. Yeah. The, the merging of the, the yes, certainly. I mean, you, it, it's, it's on uh, 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 Quasir.io uh, uh, GitHub. Um, you can try it, use it. You will have to probably uh, correct your um, uh, your machine readable data sheets because they're probably wrong. Like you know, so far every chip we've had to correct stuff, right? And you correct stuff in this sort of extension format, which is not documented, right? So these are kind of the stumbling blocks for me to like say, oh, please, people use this, right? But um, as far as a strategy, I think the strategy in other domains is quite applicable, right? So if you are uh, uh, I think uh, Gasper had a, an example where, like, if you are, if you have some uh, um, uh, vectorization register that says, "Okay, touch this, don't touch that, touch this, don't touch that, touch this," and the "touch this, don't touch that" is known at compile time, well, you can certainly, in parallel, do loads and stores on the registers that that SSE thing is not touching, right? I mean, there, there's a lot of stuff you can potentially optimize in the front end where you still have all the information, right? Hannah's uh, example is uh, obviously another example of stuff you can do in the front end, 
before you lose information context. But I will come to the HSR when this is done to the point where we can hand it off to professors and will not need to be so ashamed of myself that this particular project is so ugly <laughs> under the hood. <laughs> yes, Jan. So you're exploring um, the optimize, doing the optimizations in a DSL inside C++. Yes. And you're experiencing limitations in the, well, let's say C++ tem template language. Yes. Certain opti optimizations can just not be done right now. So yes. why, why do you think it's um, the way to go, the DSL way, instead of just um, doing the whole thing in Python and generating the const express stuff that you actually need to initialize your uh, driver in this case? Yes, that is a good uh, question. Um, there are a lot of code generators out there. Um, they are all written in some language and are usually large and, and I, you know, okay, why don't I just go and fix QMX? Because it's a code generator that basically does exactly that, right? Well, because they don't take my patches, <laughs> right? Um, as far as a, uh, uh, or, or, or uh, we'll, we'll put it this way, right? Uh, we are pretty close to the point where we can actually, I mean, we do CI on Travis, right? Which is not connect, you know, not in our office. Um, we are migrating to, you know, some local Jenkins thing. And at that point, we could do CI on the server and then just have the hardware be somewhere in the network because debuggers go over networks, right? And run tests on the CI synchronizing with the hardware. And, uh, you know, if, if I have a bunch of like cogen steps or whatever, I have to do that on a CI2, right? Or uh, I may have divergence between whatever recipe file I have, which I give to the Python and my C++ code, right? Um, I don't like external code generators. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think uh, with the uh, context for metaprogramming stuff, we will get to the point where writing it in Python externally will be less readable than writing it in C++. Um, until then, write a program, right? Yeah. So um, before we're there, yes. before we have this, this expressiveness, now we have already ex external code generations that, that could do, do the job. Yes. So yeah. Uh, yeah, none of them actually do the optimizations that they should be doing. But uh, except for maybe modem, um, I mean that's you know Jinja Jinja templates. Uh, yeah, I mean when you're writing it, you suppose you're um, okay. So external some external parties don't take patches, and you don't want maybe you don't want to rely on them. Uh, they could make their own mistakes in interpretation of the data sheets. You want to do have that in 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 your own control under your own control. I can understand that, um, but if you're writing it yourself anyway. And the expressiveness of uh, templates in C++ aren't efficient to do the actual optimization that you want to do. Then why not use an external generator? Um, I think I actually can explain this better. I can express myself better. The granularity at which you interface between external code generator and internal code is never optimal, right? I mean, the uh, I am writing a piece of code, and then I call a function. Right, that is uh, then calling into some externally generated code. Right, um, I, I I can interface with the externally generated code because the internal generated code is going to be I'm going to be expressing myself in some domain specific language, right, and <clears throat> I need to interface between that domain specific language and my C plus plus code, right? How do I do that? If that is always function calls. Then I have I don't I have a two course of a granularity of that interfacing. Right? Yeah. So uh, <coughs> if you take it one abstraction level higher, you're introducing new interfacing problems by using an external generator. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. Anyone else, Gasper? I don't know. Wait, uh, wait for the mic. <laughs> yeah. I'm on my way. I'm terrible at repeating, so wait for the mic. <laughs> Thanks. All right, so uh, in our 
copious talks about this talk. Yeah. Um, we've been uh, discussing these sorts of optimizations, like the various sorts of optimizations that you might want to have done. Uh, and you showed a class that you can do in the front end with the merging of the stores. Yeah. Um, but then we came to quite a few that can only be done in the back end, really. Yes. Um, and I thought that was super interesting. And um, you started ranting about volatile. And I, I think that that would be a really useful thing to say. <laughs> oh, yes, 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 yes. You're reminding me to say we should deprecate volatile and replace it with uh, yes. Um, I mean, I'm fine with the volatile modifier on assembler blocks, right? Like. Uh, Volatile is a concept. I mean, the cool thing about the concept of volatile is I have one category of thing, as in everything marked volatile, which, ha it, which is in sort of a different reordering domain as everything else, right? If I have a memory fence, well, nothing can pass that, right? But if I have a volatile, stuff can pass that, just not other volatiles. And that's actually a pretty cool concept. That's usually what I want, right? Um, I think as far as the other stuff, like optimizing bus clocks and whatnot, well, we, we certainly need some way of expressing that in a way that could potentially get to the back end, <laughs> right? Because only the back end can do this, right? But uh, if we're not expressing this in a like const expert initialized something and kind of promising we will never change this, We'll never like runtime change the bus clocks and whatnot. Then only then will the will the back end actually have information to be able to do this right, right? So I think it is a step in the right direction. Um, it also gives uh, static analysis tools a lot more information to work with, right? Like they know what's happening. Um, there hasn't been a whole lot of work there yet. Um, I mean, somebody wrote uh, um, something that, that, that just probably will tell you what's the deepest stack depth ever. That obviously breaks down immediately as soon as you have any indirect calls <laughs> or recursion. But you can actually see if you had an indirect call or recursion in, in well, you know, while following stack frames, right? So uh, um, yeah, you just follow all the calls and what's the deepest, right, uh, from, from different entry points. But yeah, we have, to, we have to express this thing in some way that can can go to the back end before. But I have no idea how the back end works, so that's not going to be me. <laughs> the, the, the interesting one that can only be done in the back end that we were talking about was uh, if you have uh, a bunch of stores to do or to separate memory regions that are behind different buses. Yeah. And interleaving that optimally is something only the back end can really do. Yes. Um, so the, it would be useful to be able to tell the back end, look, I promise you, this is the bus clock right now. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, in, interleaving stores on different buses is actually something I could potentially do, right? Some peripherals are on one, some peripherals are on the other. Um, I haven't implemented that yet, but at least uh, in, in sort of initialization or whatever, uh, I could obviously, because now I'm sorting by address and, and buses are different blocks of addresses. And so I'm like very much not doing that right now. Um, but I could like interleave them. Uh, that could be done in, in, in the front end. But uh, yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Any other questions or are we? Done? OK, thanks, everyone. <laughs>